Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. If you'll take your Bible and turn with me to Numbers chapter 24. We're going to read the first two verses as our text, but we'll sort of... um, We'll visit with chapters 22 and 23 as well as we proceed through the message today. And you see on the front of your bulletin a picture of our subject today, Balaam. And he's right there with his donkey, although we're not going to talk about donkey boy today. Well, we might a little bit. But, um, but uh, Balaam and his donkey are there. And this sermon is entitled, The Spirit of God and the Lost Prophet. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not, as at other times, to seek for enchantments. But he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents, according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Well, to begin with, we kind of need to um, consider Balaam's story. Now, you go back to chapter 22, and Balaam is introduced there, I think it's right there in the first, in the first verses of chapter 22. Yeah, in verse 2, Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many, and Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are around about us, as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. And he sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, and then we have the story of the calling of Balaam there. There's a people come out from Egypt, and behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. So Balaam, or Balak, wants to have um, Balaam curse Israel. Now, you can understand the fear that is present here with this man, Balak. It says that he saw them destroy the children of the Amorites. That is, he saw him destroy the king Og and the king Bashan, or the king Og and the king Sihon. So he saw that happen. Nobody had ever done that. This, these kingdoms were untouchable. untouchable. Nobody could do it. Nobody could, nobody could defeat those guys. And yet here comes Israel fresh up out of the desert. And what do they do? They burn them to the ground. Take their property. Take their castles. Take their homes. Everything. They just they completely wipe them out. And so Moab looks at that and they say, uh-oh, we have us a problem. And so he calls, and he says that we can't do it militarily, so let's do it spiritually. I'm going to get somebody to curse them. And if they're cursed, then I might be able to beat them. Or if they're cursed, they just might fade away, die off, go away. That's all, he, that's all the king of Moab wanted. He wanted them to go away. You know, he didn't want that problem on his doorstep, but they're there. So he goes to Balaam. Balaam... You know the story of Balaam? He lives in a place near the Euphrates River, probably right there on the western side of the Euphrates River. And he goes and he calls him, and he's got a reputation of being somebody who can bless and curse. So he goes for the very best guy to do the job. Now we learn more about Balaam in the New Testament, more about his character, than we do here in Numbers 22 through 24. Because in the New Testament, Peter, uh, Jude, and John all talk about Balaam. They all refer to Balaam. The, uh, Peter calls us, talks about the error of Balaam. And Jude talks about the error of Balaam. And John talks about the doctrine of Balaam. How he taught the uh, children of Moab to cause Israel to sin. And so we understand a little bit more about Balaam. He is not a nice man. He is a man who has a heart full of greed. He is a man who has a heart full of adultery. And he wants to teach the Moabites how to cause the Israelites to sin because he knows that that's the only way that God will curse them. 
is if they sin against him. Well, that's what he thinks. Of course, that's not going to happen. So, we understand who Balaam is. Second Peter, by the way, chapter 2, Jude verse 11, and Revelation 2 verse 14. There in the letters sections where you have these mentions of Balaam. Josephus, actually, not an inspired source, I know, but one of the early historians tells us about Balaam and actually has a very lengthy section about what he taught Balak and the Moabites to do. He told them to take the most beautiful young maidens in their country and to dress them up in the finest and to send them into the outskirts of Israel, the borders. He said, and if you do that, then the young men will come out to greet them. And of course, that's what happened. According to Josephus, the young men came out and the more they had relations, you know, just talking and, and, and palling around with these gorgeous Moabitish women, then the more the young men wanted to marry them. And so when they got to that point, and this is according to Josephus, what Balaam told the Moabites, when, they, when the young men got to that point, then the young women of Moab were instructed to say, well, we can't marry you unless you come and you worship our gods and you have a feast for our gods. And then perhaps we'll consider uh, marrying you. And so the young men who by that time were, you know how you are young men when you're young, you're, you're a little inflamed with passions, maybe overly so sometimes, and the young men just could not, could not see their future without these young women as their wives. And so they went and they sacrificed. And then they got more people to come. And it just, it was like a snowball. And all, everybody now was going to sacrifice to the gods of the Moabites. And then you have the circumstance where, Cos, where um, one of the uh, children of Israel brings in Cosby the uh, Moabitish lady, and then Phineas stops the plague by killing Cosby and the man. And so it's, a, it's that story, but it all begins with Balaam's advice to the Moabites. So Balaam's not a nice guy. Uh, he wasn't a nice guy back there in chapter 22 when the people came back to him a second time, and he said, I want to go with him. And God said, okay, whatever, have what you want, go with him. Go with him. And so he went with him. And, and then you'll notice here in our passage, look at uh, verse 24, or chapter 24, verse 1. And Balaam saw that it was good in the eyes of the Lord to bless Israel. He saw. That word that's translated saw or to see here in the Hebrew text means to see, just like it's translated or saw, but it, it, we find it throughout the story of Balaam. Actually, Balaam's story is a story about sight and no sight. And it begins in a very peculiar way with the donkey. In Numbers chapter 22, in verses 23 and 25 and 31 and 33, we have the story of Balaam and his donkey. And the donkey sees the angel in the way, and he stops. And the donkey says to Balaam, I saw the angel and I stopped. And then the Lord says he opens the eyes of Balaam, and then Balaam sees the angel, and the angel speaks to him. And then when he comes to Balak, Balak in chapter 23, verses 9 and verse 13 tells him, come and I'm going to put you in a place where you can see Israel. So in verse 9, it's the first time. In verse 13, it's the second time. And here in chapter 24, in verse 1, it says that he saw. So finally, Balaam's eyes are open. Balak wants him to see, but he wants, he wants him to see Israel so he'll curse them. The donkey wants him to see the angel so that he won't beat him. But now finally in chapter 24, Balaam does see. He saw that it was good in the eyes of the Lord. Again, notice, notice how that, the play on this. He sees that the, in the eyes of the Lord, it's good. So this idea of sight is all over Balaam's story, but it's really not a good kind of sight because Balaam really never sees clearly until we come to chapter 24, verse 1. 
In chapter 24, verse 1, you see the words there, when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, or that it was good in the eyes of the Lord to bless Israel. So Balaam's sight is a part of the story here. But also you'll notice that um, it's Balaam, it says that Balaam didn't seek enchantments. It said he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments. What are the enchantments? Well, if you go back to chapter 23, he comes to Balak and they have a dinner. And then Balak sets him up on top of a mountain. And Balaam says to Balak, I want you to build for me here seven altars. And I want you to get for me seven oxen and seven rams. And you're going to sacrifice all of those on the seven altars. So they're on the mountaintop. They build these altars according to Balaam's specifications. They bring in the 14 animals. So you've got seven altars, seven oxen, seven sheep, or seven rams. So there's 21 things here. So the, part of the enchantment is the proper use of numbers. So you've got three sets of seven things that Balaam is trying to use so that he can hear from God. And then it says that in each one of the incidents, he turns away. He goes to a high spot or he goes to a bald spot or he goes away into a, a private place while Balak and his minister stand around the altar. So that's another part of the enchantment. So he's doing all these things, putting all these things in place, the right numbers, the right time, the right position, the right people, doing the right things so that something might happen that he can hear from God. Compare this to Elijah on Carmel. You remember on Carmel, they go up to the top and they build one altar, or they, they build actually two altars, one for the uh, prophets of Baal and one for Elijah. And the prophets of Baal build their altar, they put the wood there, they put the animal on top, but they can't light a fire, and so what do they do? They start dancing around the altar, cutting themselves. That's their enchantments. They're trying to appease their God and to hear from him so that they can get the fire to fall, so to light somehow. They, they need that thing to light because everything's on the line. Here it is again. We're on top of a mountain. We have altars. We have animals. We have all of this because they're trying to enchant. They're trying to divine. And ladies and gentlemen, we still do that today. There are still people today. You can go in your newspaper today and find diviners in the newspaper because you can find a horoscope in your newspaper. I guess they still print that. But it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's stars or bones or sand or stones or water or wine or tea or leaves or trees or wind or streams or, uh, you know, the liver of a cow or a goat or a pig or a chicken. I mean, it just doesn't matter what it is. People find all kinds of ways to divine what it is that God wants. And still, numbers. I mean, you look at the way he uses numbers here. The seven things three times over. We still are we're captured by numbers in our society. But none of this has any effect on Balaam being able to curse Israel. The first two times when he seeks enchantments, God still speaks to him and says, here's what you're going to say. And he says it. This time, he doesn't seek for enchantments. Notice that. It says there in, the verse, in verse 1, he went not as at other times to seek, enchant, to seek for enchantments. So even though he had them build the altars and sacrifice the animals, he didn't trust that because he knew it was okay. God wanted to bless. It was good in the sight of the Lord to bless Israel. He wasn't going to get a word of curse for Israel from all of this stuff. He knew it. So he basically, and it says, he turned towards the wilderness. That is, he set his face towards the wilderness. Because there in the wilderness, that's what, where Israel was. And he just walked over there and looked down on them. He wasn't trying to gin up some sort of feeling or word or idea or poem in his heart so he could speak a curse over Israel. No, he'd given up on that now. All of the enchantments were behind him. Even though he had had them do that the third time, it's, he knew it wasn't going to work. He did that, I think, for Balak and his people. He wanted them to feel comfortable because, you know, that's how you worship Baal, too. So many times when we read passages like this, we must be very careful because 
you know, when we see that he set up altars and they had oxen and, and rams for sacrifice, we think, well, that's, that's the way, you know, that's the way the children of Israel did it. You know, they had altars and they had oxen and they had rams and they had things like that. And so we think, well, this is the worship of God. Nope, not the worship of God. This is the worship of Baal. So all of this is set up to worship Baal. So can you imagine? Here's the prophet, and I say he's the lost prophet because he is. He's in the wrong place doing the wrong thing with the wrong people trying to use enchantments so that he can hear from God, but the enchantments are for Baal. All of this is for Baal, and it's all for the prophet of these people, Balak and his ministers. He's in the wrong place with the wrong thing, and he's trying to hear from God. Be very careful when you hear someone talk about God today, because I think you must, every one of us has to ask the question, what God are you talking about? Because it's easy to say God or God said. Well, I want to know which one, because there's God's a plenty and Lord's a plenty, but there's only one Lord God, Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The only one. And so here, when we read this, we think, oh, well, this is a part of the worship of God. No, it is not. This is the part of the worship of Baal. I was thinking about this the other day. I was in the car, and I heard a commercial, and I hate this commercial, because it's a commercial for a podcast. I think it's on one of the podcast sites. I don't know. And it's, it's so that you can go to sleep at night. And it's a meditation thing. And they say, you know, and, and they played part of it. And it's got this guy with an FM radio voice, you know, real low and slow. You know, meditate on God and his goodness towards you. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and speak to you. I'm scared to death of that commercial. Because what Holy Spirit are we talking about? There's lots of spirits out there, too. And they would call themselves holy. And there's lots of gods out there. Which one are you talking about? Because that commercial mentions nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ. It mentions nothing about the Word of God. If you want to meditate, open your Bible up. Read these words and meditate on these words. You think about the cross. You think about the empty tomb. Meditate on that. Meditate on Mary's faithfulness. Meditate on Peter's faithfulness. Meditate on those things. Meditate on what they said. Don't just start thinking about God and the Holy Spirit and asking him to come. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a recipe for disaster. So I just warn you, be careful of enchantments because they're all around us. They disguise themselves well. Be careful of your charms. There are plenty of lucky charms today. Don't put your faith or trust in them. I understand when you go to the ballpark, you might want to put on your rally hat. That's okay. I'm, you know, that's not religious or anything. But, uh, or your dirty socks that you've worn to every Reds game that they've lost. I understand that. You know, it's still not going to help them, right? Yeah, but we do that religiously too, don't we? So Balaam had his enchantments, but thank God, the lost prophet, after three times now, his eyes were open, truly open, because now he sees that, you know, it's not good. The Lord, it's good in the sight of the Lord to bless Israel. Not to curse them. And so he just gives up on his champions. He didn't go seek his enchantments like he did at times before, but he set his face to the wilderness. Just like Jesus set his face to Jerusalem, the prophet intentionally goes and he looks at those people. He doesn't go to the enchantments. He, doesn't, he knows that it's the Lord's will. And can't you just imagine him standing there thinking, what am I going to say this time? What am I going to say this time? Because I know I know what the will of the Lord is. I know that it's good in his eyes to bless this people. Yeah. And then suddenly something happens. And here, here we come to the subject of the series of messages. The Spirit of God comes on him. Notice there in verse 2. He lifted up his eyes. Here's his eyes again there in verse 2. He lifted up his eyes and he saw. There it is again. There's our word again. Saw. Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. This was not some grand vision that he had. As a matter of fact, it probably wasn't very pretty at all. Because he's looking from the top of that mountain, and he's looking down into the wilderness, and he's looking at dirty, dusty tents. 
He's looking at a people, they're organized, and they're in their sections, and they're united, and there's an order to the way the camp is laid out, but it's not pretty. It's dirty, it's dusty, it's used. They've been in those tents for a long, long time now, 40 plus years, they've been in those tents. I'm sure the tents have patches on them and things, you know, and he looks out at that scene. And suddenly the Spirit of God comes on him because he sees the order there. And then his words, he says there in uh, verse 3, he takes up this parable. In verse 4, he, that's, he which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance but having his eyes open. Notice there's the eyes again. It's all about his vision. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob. And thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the valleys are they spread forth as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lime aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as the cedar trees beside the waters, he shall pour the water out of his buckets. Listen to that. God's just going to pour buckets of blessings on these people. And his seed, it shall spread all across many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Yeah, so this prophecy that he gives, and he's speaking, of course, in the presence of Balak, who wants him to curse Israel, but he doesn't do it. Why? Because the Spirit of God is on him, and he sees something that human eyes would not see. He saw the beauty of that people. Why? Because God is in their midst. He's the one that makes them beautiful. He's the one that makes them like a green valley. He's the one that makes them like tall, stout trees. He's the one that pours out fresh water upon his people. He's the one that spreads the seed abroad. He's the one that raises up a king in the midst of his people. He's the one. And Balaam never would have seen that if he had depended on his enchantments. But the Spirit of God comes upon him, opens his eyes, and he says, Aha, look there. Look at that. That's a beautiful sight. Balak says, that's an ugly sight. Balaam says, that's a gorgeous sight because God is with his people. He's in those tents. He's in those tents. So Balaam's anointing comes forward here very strong. We see what the Spirit of God does for him. Not only this, but after this prophecy, I think it's down in um, verses 17... 18, 19, I love this. Because after Balaam, you know, Balak, you know, he, he abuses him. He says, ah, oh, you, these three times now, and you've blessed him. And he, you know, he says, I was going to give you all a house full of silver and gold, you know, but not now, not after you did that. And then Balaam says, well, let me tell you what's going to happen to your people later on. He says, you think that's bad? Hold on to your hands. And then he begins in 17, and he says, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to read this. He says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Ladies and gentlemen, who is that? It's the Lord Jesus. This is what the kings came with when they came to Jerusalem. The three kings, or however many kings there were, they came and they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Because we saw his star in the east. They were reading Balaam's prophecy. So the Spirit of God not only speaks of the beauty of God's people, but looks forward to Messiah. Why is that? Because the Spirit of God always speaks of Messiah. He never speaks of himself. He always speaks of Messiah. And what a beautiful thing. He quotes the promise made to Abraham. Look down there in, in verse 9. I love this part too. Verse 9 is the end of that first prophecy there in the third, the third attempt. He said, he couched, he lay down as a lion, as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. Where does he get that last piece? Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. He gets that from the covenant God made with Abraham all the way back in chapter 12 of Genesis. That's where, he, that's where that comes from. And how does Balaam know that? Balaam doesn't know that. But the Spirit of God does. 
And the Spirit of God is quoting something that was said to Abraham hundreds of years before. And now here it is again. Balak, you think you're going to curse? No, sir. The curse will be on you. Of course, it was on him. So the Spirit of God, Balaam's anointing, points to Christ, points to the protection of the people, points to the beauty of the people. The Spirit moves on Balaam. And I want you to notice, too, before I come to a conclusion here, that the Spirit of God moves on Balaam after he gave up. In the first trial, in, uh, in chapter 23, verses whatever it was, 23, 8, I think. Yeah, there, there in that first go-around, he is seeking the enchantments, and God tells him, this is what you're going to say. The second trial there at the end of 23, he brought him unto the, unto the top of Pisgah and built seven altars. And there again, he blesses Israel. But this time, even though they made these altars, he doesn't, he doesn't even try for the enchantments. And it's, I think it's wonderful that the Spirit of God moves on him after he just resigned himself to God's will. Ladies and gentlemen, that is always the way the Spirit of God comes on us. When we go in our own strength and our own cleverness and in our own enchantments and we try to do it our way and we try to have our own spirituality and me and Jesus, we got our own thing going, all of that, when we give up on that, then the Spirit of God can use us. Because when we say, I am the poor man, I am the, I'm the man who is in need, when we say, I am the one who lies in the dust, then the Spirit of God will speak through us and to us and indwell us. That's how we all came to Christ. Every single one of us came to Christ that very way. We gave up and we said, I am a sinner. I am dead. Please give me life. That's when the Spirit of God comes on a man, is when he gives up or she gives up. And the Spirit of God comes with so many blessings. Oh, and can I, just, can I just sort of do a, a side note here? I'm talking about blessings on the people of God and the Spirit of God. Just real quick. Just, there's so many good things in Balaam's prophecy, which, of course, Balaam never, ever intended. Uh, No, it's not that one. It's the second one. Yeah, there in the second, in the second uh, blessing that Balaam gives the people, verse 19 is where that begins. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received a commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not, now here it is, verse 21. Look at this. Now, what he says about the people there in, ver in the third blessing there in chapter 24, about their beauty and the blessing of God being in their midst and the king rising up, listen to these words too. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Now, hold on just a minute. Just a minute. I could take you to many places in Numbers, in Exodus, in Genesis, where I saw plenty of perverseness in Israel, we can all go back and look at those places where the people mumbled and they sinned and they committed adulteries and they did all kinds of stupid stuff. They rejected the manna, you know. They asked for quail and what enough, all of that. They murmured because they didn't have enough water. All of the things they did wrong. We can make a list of all the stuff from the time they left Egypt until they get here. Of all the things they've done wrong. But notice what the Lord says through Balaam here. He says, he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. If you were to take a list of all of my sins since the time I came to Christ until this very day, it would be so long it would fill this room. You would, you would have reams and reams of paper to show how corrupt David Smith is. But guess what heaven sees? No iniquity. Guess what heaven, heaven sees? In me, there is no, what does he say there? He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Why is that? 
Because God had entered into covenant with these people. And as far as God was concerned, from his perspective, they're just fine. He's forgiven them. He has, he has indwelt them. He has given them of his spirit in those tents. His very presence is there. Now, from the outside, the world looks at it and says, oh, look at that corrupt bunch. Oh, look at that bunch of nasty folk. Look at what they've done wrong. But God says, "Uh uh-uh, those are my people. I don't see any iniquity in them. And if I don't see the iniquity, guess what? It doesn't exist. It only exists in the minds of those who are not indwelled by the Spirit of God. But God sees in us. So ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow, today, whenever it is that you are in your prayer closet and you're grieving over some recent sin, remember it's you must repent of that sin, but in heaven, God says it's okay. I've taken care of it. I don't see it in you. That's his perspective. And sometimes those perspectives, our visions, are so different. He sees one thing, we see another, but it's his vision, ladies and gentlemen, that's eternal and that's lasting. He sees no perverseness, no corruption. I cannot, I, he says, I have not beheld iniquity in Jacob. God brought them out of Egypt. He has, it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? Amen. And it will be said the same of the church. All right, let me move quickly now to my conclusion. Let's apply this. Number one, and I know we really didn't cover this much in the passage, but number one, greed, God will not have it. It's not a part of his plan. Balaam was working on the theory that he was going to get paid a bunch of money to do this thing. Didn't happen that way. Number two, enchantments. Be careful of your good luck charms. Be careful of the gods the people are claiming to worship and serve because may not be the same one that has saved you from sin. Run quickly from the modern day diviners, which are old traps into which many spiritually curious people fall. Be careful. Run from them. You don't need to find somebody with a tarot deck. You don't need someone to look at the stars for you. You don't need anybody to read a tea leaf or to look at the, the Chinese cards or whatever those things are. You don't need any of that. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the Spirit of God within you. You need not enchantments to hear from Him. And if you really want to hear from Him, read, it, read your Bible. And if you want to hear from Him out loud, read it out loud. There you'll hear the Word of God. Many things call themselves God today. They are not. Be careful. Thirdly, sight. What a beautiful thing. It's a thing given only by God, and it comes with and by the Spirit of God. Sight is something that is given to the children of God. When we come to Christ and are baptized by the Holy Ghost into the body of Christ, we receive the sight of the Spirit of God so that we can see the things in His Word, so that we can understand the blessings that are ours, so that we can understand the covenant that we have been placed in, so that we can understand our future and our hope, and so that we can share with other people what it means to be in Christ. Sight is a beautiful thing, but it only comes by the Spirit of God. And fourthly, The Spirit of God only points to Christ, points to the blessing of his people and to Christ. Always the Spirit of God points to Christ. He is the heart of all prophecy. He is the center of all worship. He is the the driving force of everything the Spirit of God does in and by the church. Our good works are are empowered by the Spirit of God so that we might share the glory of God to the world. But all of that points to our Savior. Our worship is empowered by the Spirit of God so that we might point to the Savior. It's all about Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God is the one who empowers it, who opens the eyes. And... He is the one that calls us. As I said last week, we talked about effectual calling last week. He's the one that calls us. And he is working in folk here and abroad to call them to the gospel. He is speaking and opening eyes and and softening hearts. 
as, I, as the old uh, bluegrass writer put it, he's tenderizing hearts every day. The Spirit of God is working. And he worked through this man, Balaam, although, as I said, the lost prophet. But Balaam's end here is, at least part of it, is so good and gives us quite a legacy. A heritage, actually. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.